Hello. Hi, everybody. Hey, it's 8 p.m., uh, at least on the uh, West Coast. It is 8 p.m. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Kasson. Thanks for being here. Um, haven't done a live stream here in four years. But it's been quite a while, um, so glad to be back. Um, thanks who are, uh, for everybody who's showing up right away. Uh, welcome for everybody who is asleep or doing something else who is watching this at a later point. Thanks for joining. Um, for those who are live right now, um, if you hear or see things that seem a little weird, need to be turned up or down, uh, let me know. I think I got everything balanced here, so when I switch over to VR, uh, the audio should sound good. Um, so yeah, so I've been working on a project called Morph, with a parentheses around the M, for probably about four years now. Um, for a great deal of that time, it was pretty slow. Um, but uh, in the last year, especially being locked inside and can't see anybody or go play shows, I've made a lot of progress on it. Uh, and I'm excited for it to be coming out soon. Um, essentially, the high level is that it is an interactive music VR project uh, for Oculus, for the Rift, Rift S, and um, for the Quest and One, and then the Quest 2, which I think will be shipping out to people in November. I ordered mine. I'm very excited. Um, and the project basically started about four years ago, and I'm going to give you some quick backstory. Um, then I'm going to do a performance of a song that I wrote um, in the experience uh, for a project of mine called Black House Triangle, which is sort of a weird experimental project. Uh, and afterwards, if people are still around and have some questions, I will try to give you some answers. Um, and I'm going to do future live streams of Morph, maybe every other week, probably at the same time. And um, I'm going to focus probably one of them like solely on artists and maybe see if I can get some of the other artists that are involved with the project to come in and join me uh, remotely on a live stream and also do a performance of one of their songs. Um, I want to spend some time to go into the real technical side of things, Unity and spatial audio and all of that super nerdy stuff. And so maybe you can join me for one of those. So yeah, I think I'm going to do, I'm going to do a few of these uh, over time. So uh, some quick backstory is that um, about, uh, several years ago, I was at the Seattle Art Museum. Um, I had like an hour to kill, so I was just sort of quickly walking through. Um, and I had saw, uh, I saw some art that I had never seen before. Um, and we had like three or four paintings. And so I went up and was reading the description and went home and started just doing a deep dive on it all. And uh, it was this uh, art period that I had never heard of called Orphan. Orphism, um, and I was like, "What is Orphism?" I'll post a. Let me see if I can post a link over here. Just posted a link over in the chat of a Google image search. So if you want to go quickly look at it, uh, basically Orphism is one of the first, if not the first, purely abstract art uh, style. Uh, it was right before World War I, so back in like 1914, 1915, and it was almost solely centered in France and Paris, and you know there was sort of a huge art and creative community there. Um, and for a few years, they made art that was ostensibly like extremely abstract, pure abstract, right? No impressionism where you could sort of stand back and be like, oh, I know what this is, or I get a sense what this is. This was just like big, bold colors, lots of circles, and... And when I looked at it, I just, I couldn't believe what time period it was from. I thought it was from the 1950s or 60s, much, much later. And so I was sort of blown away that the abstract art movement had started that early. Um, and then World War I hit, and then Cubism followed, and, and then sort of meandered its way back to a lot of art like Orphism, uh, which is these just like bold colors and abstract shapes. And I was, I was really digging it. I was really inspired by it. And musically... Um, I, you know, I make a lot of sort of what I consider to be very structured, almost pop music, synth pop, down tempo, techno. Um, and a few years ago, I was really getting interested in uh, ambient music, electroacoustic music, experimental music, drone, and sort of the really weird, weird esoteric experimental side of electronic music. And so seeing this art inspired me to start thinking about like, well, if I wanted to really make very abstract music, 
how would I even do that, right? I'm used to sitting in front of a drum machine, QY70, you know, this gear that like is a sequencer and it has all these constraints to it. And then the music I make is very structured. It's verses and choruses and bridges and abstract music is throws all that stuff away, right? And, and focuses on, on different spectrums of the creative process and creative output. And so seeing that art really sort of made me start to think about like, well, if I'm going to do this, how can I do this? Like, what's the best thing I can do? And I've really been into modular synthesizers for a while, both current and vintage. And those are great tools to make weird music. Um, I got really into the gear that Folk Tech was making down in Portland. Um, I got a resonant garden and really started to embrace, you know, using gear that was sort of like very abstract and, and unpredictable. And I, that really was something that drew me to the music was this sort of unpredictable nature. I'm so used to controlling every single aspect of the song I write. Um, so the gear lets me make, you know, abstract music, but I was like less concerned about the gear and I wanted to look at other parts of my creative process and see if I could find one part of that process that was pretty constraining and see if I could disrupt that that part of the process and and disrupt it so much that it would actually mean that my compositional pro, uh, process all the way back at the beginning would have to be rethought so that I couldn't fall back into the standard ways of me making the music I normally made. And so I sort of looked at the whole process and what stood out for me was the area of um, the, in the mix process in the DAW, right? So in your digital audio workstation, Ableton, Logic, Pro Tools, you, you get all your tracks together after sort of like experimenting and then you sort of meticulously mix them in these programs. I use Digital Performer um, and you know, and really that gives you the ultimate control over your mix, you know, volumes going up and down and, um, you know, automation and, you know, like down to like the sample level, you can make things quieter or louder or pan them left and right or add effects. And you have just this insane amount of control over the music you make. And I was like that right there, that's the thing I need to change. I need to like stop mixing in a DAW because there's all these constraints and I need to remove those constraints or at least change them and maybe replace them with a different set of constraints and see what, see what that yields. And so one of the things I was getting disillusioned about um, in, the, in those tools was just the concept of stereo. Uh, we're so used to just the idea that we have two speakers or you know we have a pair of headphones and it's got left and right and we have two ears and that's where you hear. And so like you move something to the left and you move something to the right. And if you wanna make something loud or quiet, you use this artificial construct called volume to like make this one thing louder than this thing. And I was getting pretty disillusioned with those concepts. Um, and after having spent a little over a year working at Microsoft on HoloLens, my whole world there was all about um, spatial audio, HRTF, binaural audio, ambisonic audio, experimenting with all these um, technologies which were invented years ago in the 50s and the 60s. And I'd already been really into quadraphonic music coming out of the 60s. And I've mixed some of my own music in discrete four channel surround. But the idea of putting on the headphones and entering this world of spatial audio um, was really intriguing to me. And the opportunities with VR and AR and HoloLens to basically build this immersive sonic world around you was really intriguing. Um, and DAWs don't really do that very well. I mean, you can decode ambisonic audio and things like that, but essentially you're still working in the world of volume, artificial volume, loud and soft, and you have all this control. And, and what it realized to me was that this control, this tight control over the mix was the thing that was forcing my songs into this thing, in this area, creative space, that wasn't super inspiring. There was no room for happy accidents. All the rough edges were getting sanded off. Um, and so I decided, okay, that's what I need to get rid of. I need to get rid of my mixing environment and I need to mix somewhere else. And because I've been sort of following VR and having worked on HoloLens, it seemed like a natural idea to see like, well, why don't I just I invent a new space in VR for me to do the mixing process? Um, and one of the benefits of doing that, moving it over into VR, is that spatialization 
is just a part of that. Um, and so I could sort of throw away the standard idea of volume and replace it with a different idea of volume. And that's where I started. So I'm like, okay, I'll start making a project, a VR project. I didn't know what platform and all that. So I just sort of gravitated towards Unity and um, started to build an environment and, and sort of like wrangled some friends to help me out. I don't know Unity scripting. I can read them, but I can't really write them. I don't know the syntax. And so I had friends really helping me out and starting to build some scripts. And very slowly I built a little environment in VR where I could bring in my own audio that I would render out as mono stems and bring them in. And I could attach that to an emitter and I could place it in, in space, in three-dimensional space. And the way humans hear is based on distance, right? So the louder I am to you, uh, the closer I am to you, the louder I am. And the more I back up and get farther away from you, the quieter I get from you. And that's how humans hear, that's how our ears work. Um, and so in VR, you can do the same thing, which is like I can basically take an audio object and if I move it away from me, it's quiet. And if I bring it, if bring it, if I bring it close to me, then it's loud. And uh, you don't do that. That doesn't happen in, in DAWs. You just turn a volume up and down. And so I really like the sort of human real world aspect of like saying, if I want one thing quieter than another thing, I need to just move this thing farther away from me. And if I want it to be over to the left, I just move the object to the left of my head or I move it to the right of my head. And then to go beyond stereo, and now I have 360 degrees using spatial audio, I can put an object above me or below me or behind me, or I can move them around me. Um, now, I love spatial audio, and uh, I think in a future live stream, I'll probably go super nerdy into spatial audio and what I like about it and dislike about it. So I'm going to set that aside. But essentially, I built this Unity environment that let me bring my own music in as multi-track stems and start to mix it by grabbing audio objects and placing them around me. Um, and it was super exciting. Um, but what I realized was that I still had a lot of control over things. Um, I could just, I could move all the audio objects around and then sit back and be like, cool, that sounds good. But essentially I still had all the control and it became clear to me I need to remove the control. So I started to imbue the Unity environment with physics attributes so that the objects started to take on a life of their own. And so now I'm in a three dimensional space and they're floating around. And if they float by me, I hear them. And if they float away from them, from me, then I no longer hear them. And so. At any given time, I can grab one or two and bring it near me. But meanwhile, they're all off going there, doing their own thing. Um, and I thought that that was really exciting. And so I sort of doubled down on that whole space of removing the control from me and giving the control over to other things. In this case, I'm passing the control over to physics, to velocity and momentum and rotation and bouncing off things and collisions in this whole world. And, and it was super fun. And I started to bring my own music in and realize what worked and what didn't work. My traditional music of verses and courses didn't work because I needed to hear this vocal at this time. And in my, when I brought it into VR, now my vocal was floating away from me and I could no longer hear it. So I basically, it forced me to go back to the composition process, throw away the way I would normally make music and start to compose music that would work well in this environment. And, if, and naturally, experimental music, ambient music works great um, because there are no constraints. Um, and in this case, it infinitely loops and it never ends. And it's this constantly morphing, dynamic musical experience. Um, so, okay, so I'm not gonna, this is a little long winded and I wanna get into the performance. Um, so very quickly, I just, I wanna thank a few people. Um, the project is now basically in a beta stage and I'm hoping to release it as soon as I can pass Oculus, uh, their whole verification validation process so that the Rift application can actually show up on the Rift PC store. And then the Quest version, um, because I can't get into the Quest store because it's highly curated, um, that will be over on probably itch.io and sidequestvr.com. And in fact, my guess is that you'll be able to be able to go and get the experience, the soundtrack on Bandcamp um, for free, and it'll come with download information. So if you have a Quest or a Rift, you'll get a PCA executable or you'll get a Quest build with instructions. You have to do the whole side loading thing it's a pain in the butt, but you can get it running and I'll be able to help. 
Um, so I want to thank uh, my friend Eric Malafieu and Kevin Bryan, who have been two coders that have been really essential in helping me build this Unity environment and script things out and, and do a huge amount of the technical back end. Um, I want to thank my friend Boggy. Uh, Eric Malfew and Boggy and I worked at Harmonix making, you know, like rock, rock Band and Dance Central and all those really cool music games. And I was able to get Boggy to help build some amazing 3D art for me. Um, and then I want to give a shout out to uh, Masaru Fuji in Japan who makes this amazing generative art. And so all of the artwork for the songs, um, he, he writes code for and it generates these beautiful images. Um, and I've mapped them onto the walls of this experience. So you'll see in the background this generative art that he's created. So, so uh, And then there's all the artists. There's going to be nine artists um, who have songs inside the experience. And in a future live stream, I'll talk about the different artists and maybe even get them to join me. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to do a performance. I'm going to put on my Quest One and my headphones and... Um, give you a performance of a song that I wrote for this project of mine called Black House Triangle. And we'll do that for a while. Um, again, like, I don't really know how long. Um, it's a looping, constantly evolving, dynamic experience. So sometimes I'm in there for five minutes and sometimes I'm in there for a while. I'm gonna aim for around 20 minutes and then um, hang around and um, let me know if you have any questions afterwards and we can talk a little, a little bit more about it. Um, so give me a moment to prep here, and first thing I can do is... Fade this over to VR, that seems to be working. All right, I'm going to turn off the webcam mic, and this is a song called Id Ego Super Ego by my project called Black House Triangle, and... I've got a song on Bandcamp, which you can check out, and I've taken that song and sort of like uh, transmogrified it into a new version that is now in this VR project. So, all right, here we go.
All right, there you have it. The debut performance of my music VR project. Reading the comments now for the first time. Ah, sounds like audio happened. That's good. Thank you, OBS, for working. Um, yeah, so that's a song from my project called Black House Triangle, um, which is on Bandcamp. And uh, when I release, when I release the project, um, there's going to be nine songs and a soundtrack that come along with it. And the uh, project is going to be free. Uh, the soundtrack will be free. Uh, of course, donations would be great. Costs a lot of money to pay programmers and artists to make all the cool stuff you saw happen. Um, but it's just been a real patchet, passion project of mine for years. And so I'm going to release it as a public beta, which means it's not done. In fact, I don't think it will ever be done. Uh, my hope is that maybe in January when the Oculus Quest Store allows uh, non-curated apps to show up, that might be when I do a... Um, uh, when I do an official release and add more songs uh, to it and increase the art and add some more functionality and things of that nature. Um, and in future uh, live streams, I'll go probably deeper into certain aspects of the art or the creativity and the technical stuff. Um, but yeah, that wraps it up for this. Um, thank you for everybody showing up. Um, does anybody have any questions that they want to write in the chat window? Or should uh, we wrap it up and just start drinking? Wait, I'm drinking right now. Uh, thanks for all the nice comments. Uh, nice to see some friends in here. Yancey, nice to see you. Kevin, Brian, thanks for showing up. Uh, ah, yep, Logan, nice to see you. Uh, DJ Gnai, everybody, cool. Rim State, awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah, REM state. I think in a future one, I think the next one I'm going to do is going to be um, artist focused. So I'm going to reach out to some of the other artists and maybe see if I can get them to comment or maybe even join this live stream. And maybe instead of doing a really long form 20 minute prison uh, performance, maybe I'll do shorter ones and show off a few other songs in the app. Um, very quickly, I found out that more than just my music would work in it. And so I reached out to some of my favorite uh, ambient, uh, electronic, um, experimental artists to um, get them to wrap their heads around what it is to make music inside of this and release control over the mix and all that stuff. And so, yeah, so I think in a future one, we'll get, um, we'll get super nerdy. Actually, I'll probably see if I can get Kevin to come back. We'll talk about Unity. I'll have the Unity project. Uh, we'll talk about spatial audio, some aspects I like, some things that aren't working so well. And um, uh, yeah, it's just been a super fun project. Um, seems like you guys had a good time. Awesome. Thanks for showing up. Um, any last questions or should we call it a night? All right. That's good. I think we can call it a night. Glad you guys enjoyed some chill, experimental otherworldly, dreamy music. Maybe it accompanied some drugs, maybe, might help. I don't know, anyways. Uh, okay, everybody, thank you so much. And uh, for you guys joining in later on, uh, watching the archive of this, thanks for showing up and checking it out. Come back, uh, follow Morph on Facebook. Uh, I believe it's just Morph Sound is the name of it. Um, I'll post a link over here in the chat. And uh, yeah, thanks again. All right. See you on the other side.